When men of courage and vision, men with dreams, struggled to build the Golden West. For along these banks, a great metropolis was born. It was here the giants of a pioneer era built the city of Sacramento. Some of the sights and sounds of yesterday can still be seen, but the yesterdays they represent are almost forgotten. excitement, the drama of the past, and a frontier city that was vibrant, vigorous, and alive. A few of the city's first buildings from the early days still stand. And what strange and exciting stories these buildings could tell, of fearless pioneers and courageous immigrants, men who came to find gold and stayed to build a city. Each building has its own special story, as individual as the man who built it. Within these walls, events occurred that were to shape the destiny of a state and a nation. Once, these buildings were proud, dignified symbols of the city's glorious past, reminders of the dramatic years of Sacramento's early settlement. But the mood has changed. Time, neglect, and human indifference have left their mark. Shabby, mutilated, defiled, decaying and crumbling into ruins. The remnants of the original city, these mute witnesses to history, stand abandoned and all but forgotten. The past is silent, and there are few to tell the story of what happened here. A story that began over a hundred years ago with a Swiss adventurer, John August Sutter, who sailed up the mighty Sacramento River to found a new colony in California. The year was 1839. Here he built a huge adobe fort that was civilization's lone outpost in the interior of California and it soon became the goal of thousands of overland immigrants. For all these rugged pioneers, the journey to the west by covered wagon was long, hard, and hazardous. 2,000 tortuous miles to be covered, 12, sometimes 15 miles a day across the deserts, the plains, and the mountains. The women walked beside the men. The overburdened oxen sometimes fell exhausted. The long journey to the Pacific was a perilous one. And for some, it ended in tragedy. Last, the mountains were behind them, and the immigrants arrived at the fort. Sutter furnished them with shelter and supplies, or put them to work. The fort was like a miniature town, complete within itself. In July of 1846, the flag of the United States of America was first raised over Sutter's fort. Sutter knew that the new settlers would need lumber for houses. And he contracted with James Marshall to build a sawmill at Coloma on the American River. Early one morning in January, Marshall found a few pieces of metal in the tail race of the mill. The year was 1848. 
gold had been discovered in California. 100,000 frenzied Argonauts headed for California to seek their fortunes in the gold fields. They came overland in dusty wagon trains, on horseback, some even on foot. Many came by sea, sailing 17 to 18,000 miles around the Horn headed for San Francisco. And they sang as they came. Oh, California, that's the land for me. I'm bound for California with my washbowl on my knee. The cry was gold, gold. But when they got to the fabled gold fields, they found that mining was not easy and life was full of hardships. Using primitive tools, the work was backbreaking and the hours long. Digging, panning, using a cradle or rocker, sluicing, they struggled to find the precious metal. Gold was got in pan and pot, soup, tureen or ladle, basket, bird cage or whatnot, even to a cradle. And on Sunday they rested catching up on their chores, or having a little fun on their day of leisure. But most of their time was spent at the diggings. Every man dreamed of making his fortune. Some struck it rich, others did not. As the year 1848 came to a close, John Sutter Jr. laid out the plans for a city on the banks of the river and named it Sacramento. The young city on the Embarcadero was the gateway to the mines. When the adventurous 49ers arrived, they found the waterfront swarming with sailing vessels and early steamboats. The shore lined with covered wagons, tents, sheds, and even wood-framed buildings. Seven months after its birth, the city's population was 10,000. The miners streamed into young Sacramento for their supplies. And even at wildly inflated prices, the enterprising merchants did an overwhelming business. It was here that the miners brought their gold and eagerly spent it. At the Eagle Theater, the first theater in the West, and the only theater in Sacramento, the double bill featured a drama and a comedy. At the City Hotel, they celebrated the 4th of July with a grand ball. 200 men had bought tickets at $32, and had canvassed the country to find the 18 ladies who graced the occasion. And when there were no women, it was like the world's greatest stag party, but gambling was the greatest sport of all. The saloons and gambling halls flourished, every one of them crowded and every table blockaded by an eager crowd of gamesters. In wild one-night spurges, miners squandered their hard-won gold dust and then went back to the mines to dig for more. The gold rush was in full swing and the young city continued to grow struggling to keep pace with a migration that has been called the spectacle of the ages. The year 1849 was coming to a close. Just a few days after New Year's 1850, incessant pounding rains swelled the rivers to the limits of their banks and the entire city was deluged under muddy, swirling water. 
notes that rented for $30 an hour or sold for a thousand gathered up women and children, the helpless and the sick. The Eagle Theater was flooded and closed permanently. But when the waters receded, the undaunted citizens rebuilt their city. In two years, Sacramento grew to 500 businesses and more than 2,000 homes. November 2nd, 1852, Black Tuesday. A great sea of flames, moving with forked tongue from street to alley, crumbled everything to a smoldering heap of ashes. But the determined citizens rebuilt their city. Within a month, they constructed 761 buildings. They had no sooner recovered from the fire when another flood struck on New Year's Day, 1853. Once again, boats of all sizes covered the submerged streets of Sacramento. While the city was underwater, the citizens moved to higher ground. A temporary village called Hoboken sprung up four miles from the city. Its muddy streets were crowded from morning to night with the busy merchants conducting business as usual. A year and a half later, Sacramento suffered another disastrous fire. This time, the firemen turned out in force because the city had built its first waterworks. And with water to fight the flames, the gallant fire laddies worked hard to save what property they could. Even so, parts of the city were leveled. Again, the citizens quickly rebuilt their city. Through fire, flood, and disaster, the motto of early Sacramento was business as usual. Within four months, there were 2,500 buildings. They reflected architectural influences from all over the world, as well as the affluence and personal whims of the builders. While struggling to survive the floods and fires, Sacramentans still found time to campaign vigorously to make their city the state capital. They succeeded, and the bill was signed in 1854. Two years later, the first steam railroad in the West, the Sacramento Valley Railroad, was completed by a young engineer, Theodore Judah. From a terminal on the levee, a gaudy little engine weighing 18 tons, with the name Sacramento emblazoned on its cab, chugged along 22 miles of track to Folsom. But for Judah, 22 miles was only a very small beginning, for his dream was a railroad across the continent. Even more important as a means of transportation than the new railroad, with the stately steamers churning their way up and down the river. The riverboats made the trip by daylight to San Francisco, averaging seven knots an hour and carrying 100 passengers. The fare was $30. These were romantic days on the Sacramento River. The floating palaces, decks alight, glided by the shore. And sometimes they raced, steamer against steamer, to prove which was the better boat. While on land, an historic race against time began in front of the B.F. Hastings building on the morning of April 4th, 1860. 
pledged to deliver the mail across 2,000 miles of wilderness in only 10 days, the Pony Express was a bold, reckless, and exciting adventure. In all kinds of weather, fearless young western daredevils on swift thoroughbred ponies raced from relay station to relay station to live up to their motto, the mail must go through. The famous saga of the Pony Express ended October 24, 1861, two days after the completion of the Transcontinental Telegraph. At the same time, traveling the frontier roads were the six-horse teams of the rugged stagecoaches. Some of the stage lines struck out from Sacramento, carrying the miners north to the gold fields. Other lines ran between California and the eastern end of the railway in Missouri. They carried passengers, mail, and gold over the trails marked by earlier pioneers. The stage driver was king of the road, urging his plunging team on and on across the wilderness, day and night, in every kind of weather. 2,800 miles in 25 days. The fare was $200, and you sat up all the way in a dusty coach on a jolting, swaying, rocking, rattling, and often dangerous trip. Some stops were scheduled, some were not. In spite of the danger and discomfort, you usually got where you wanted to go. The way to California was long and hard. Only a railroad could successfully unite the East and the West. The young engineer in Sacramento, Theodore Judah, believed he knew how to do it. The townsfolk called him Crazy Judah, but he convinced four Sacramento businessmen to invest in his dream. Charles Crocker, dry goods man. Leland Stanford, wholesale grocer. Collis P. Huntington. And Mark Hopkins, hardware merchants. The year was 1861. The Big Four founded the Central Pacific Railroad Company. Work was begun in 1863 and was to continue for six long years. The job was heavy, hard, and dangerous. Construction almost stopped when many of the workers deserted because silver had been discovered in Nevada. So Crocker hired 15,000 Chinese. They were small and didn't look very strong, but they tackled the almost impossible job. Rugged mountains made progress especially slow. At times, only 20 miles of track was laid in a year. Finally, they brought the shining tracks of the Central Pacific over the nearly impassable terrain of the Sierras. And people had said it could not be done. Meanwhile, westward from Omaha, the Irish workmen of the Union Pacific were laying tracks. Somewhere, the two rail lines would meet. The government offered a bonus of land and money for every mile of track laid. And so the race was on. Union Pacific, against Central Pacific. Digging, blasting, pounding, driving across the country. The mountains and the plains sang with a grand anvil chorus of sledgehammers. Three strokes to the spike, 10 spikes to the rail, 400 rails to a mile, 700 miles, and three million strokes to the finish line. 
for the hard-driving men who built the Central Pacific. On May 10, 1869, the two crews met at Promontory, Utah. The railroad was open. The West was linked to the East. Seven days from New York to California. And the people came, many of them to Sacramento. But keeping up with thousands of new settlers was an old story to her enterprising citizens. The Transcontinental Railroad radically changed the Embarcadero. The riverfront was filled with switch lines and freight sheds serving the Central Pacific, the Sacramento Valley Railroad, and the California Steam Navigation Company. This was also the heyday of horse-drawn vehicles. Wagons, omnibuses, buggies, carriages, and the horse-drawn streetcars of the Sacramento Street Railroad clattered through all of the city's thoroughfares. During the years, there had been many changes in the face of the young city. At a cost of two and a half million dollars, the Capitol building was completed in 1874. It was, and still is, considered to be one of America's outstanding state structures. Businesses thrive, including hotels and newspapers. The energetic citizens built hospitals, schools, churches. They were particularly proud of the first art museum west of the Mississippi and a unique governor's mansion, still standing today. The architecture of these structures reflected the times. There was a strong influence of the restless spirit and vigor of the young city and the adventurous men who built her. The buildings they left are a chronicle of their lives. Who were the people who built this great city? Individual men and women, the famous and the not so famous, each contributing in his own way, each playing a role in the historic drama of the early Sacramento story. The banker, fireman, journalist, gambler, judge, miner, city councilman, carriage maker, doctor, riverboat captain, mayor, blacksmith, minister, carpenter, merchant, stagecoach driver, senator, saddle maker, the governors, and many, many others. These were the people of courage, vision, and action who were the very heartbeat of a lusty pioneer city. From its humble beginning along the banks of a restless river, Sacramento has emerged a modern dynamic metropolis. Today's citizens of Sacramento, descendants of those pioneers, look to the future but their roots are in the past. They remember their heritage. They are not content that the past remain silent. They see a challenge and a responsibility in preserving for future generations, for the children of tomorrow, the great historical heritage of old Sacramento.
designated as both a state and national historic landmark. Here, the past, over a century old, will come alive. In the recreation of this area, as it was during the dynamic period from 1849 to 1870. Here in old Sacramento, history will live again in all its former glory to enrich the lives of thousands of Americans for generations to come. Here where countless human dramas have been played out will be a place where you can feel your heritage in the heartbeat of living history. For history is the witness of the times, the torch of truth, the life of memory, the teacher of life, the messenger of antiquity.